Welcome, friends, once again to this class series on magnetism and right attitude in the face of adversity. Some of you were with me on Saturday night when I covered two topics specifically. I spoke about the necessity for will, to keep our will very strong, and also this aspect of keeping an affirmative attitude, of that also helping us to develop the will, and as we know, when we develop the will, the greater the will, the greater the flow of energy, and the greater the flow of energy, the greater the magnetism. And when we have strong magnetism, we ward off some of the negative influences that we find and encounter yeah, in our life, in the world. And that is very important for us today because of the struggles that the world is facing with this C-19 virus that's uh, plaguing so many countries and here coming into India, perhaps not quite as fast as in Europe, but nevertheless, it has its presence known and it's growing little by little. This evening, I want to move on from that, but in a related way and address two additional topics and you'll see the relationship. Now, I'm sure most of you have read about the virus, uh, about its effects on the body uh, for those people who do get the virus. And you know that it's also much more uh, serious for people in advanced years to, to come down with the infection. The possibility of being put into ICU in the hospital, the possibility of even succumbing to the virus is much higher for those who are, who are seniors in, in our society. Whereas those people who are young, they may get a case of it and they may not even know it. It may, may be asymptomatic or if it's very mild. Although I do want to say that young people also can get it very serious and it can also be fatal for young people. So it's not something to be toying with and to disregard. But nevertheless, I think we're, we've come to be aware that it's more of the senior population that is, that is uh, threatened more by this than the younger one. So it's important for those of us who are perhaps a little bit senior in years, and I include myself in that, to take heed of the situation and look and how does this virus affect us? What are the symptoms that come? And typically when somebody succumbs to this virus, it's because it attacks the lungs. Eventually a person develops, gets the virus, they have fever, many common symptoms that may even appear to be like flu-like, but it begins to attack the lungs and to create the bilateral pneumonia. And one of the ways that doctors can diagnose a person with the disease, they take a scan of the lungs and they can see this clouding. It's called a, a, a like a ground glass a sort of feature in the scan and it's a symptom that the lungs are being infected and as the lungs become infected the ability to breathe and to take in oxygen the tissues in there begin to be swollen and they can no longer take in the oxygen and I remember reading a day or so ago about one person describing the symptoms that he felt and he said it was if somebody had put a belt a thick belt or strap around his chest and was tightening it and it was made very tight and very difficult for him to get his breath and it became labored. And this is what happened. A person goes into then into ICU, they need oxygen in order to supplement their, their breathing process and then eventually even perhaps put upon a, a ventilator to be able to help them. So if this is going to attack the lungs, we as yogis know all about lungs, don't we? Because this isn't one of the central features of when we begin to study these teachings is to develop the lung capacity. For the, many of you, I think, are Kriyabans, and you know the importance of breath in the practice of Kriya. And those of you who are not Kriyabans, what I say today is going to apply both, whether you're a Kriyaban or not, the necessity for us in order to be prepared because we don't know who's going to get it and who's not going to get it. Some people predict that eventually 50% of the population will someday be affected. And to the degree that we can have a healthy body to be able to fight off this disease, we're going to be in a better position. And so I feel that all of us right now need to be strengthening 
our lung capacity. And to do that, we need to pay attention to that central feature of the practice of yoga, and also in Kriya Yoga, is the development of breath capacity. I serve as a Kriya Charya, which means I initiate people into Kriya. And when I do that, typically people a little bit afterwards, they will ask me to check their Kriya practice. How are they doing? And I will listen and observe how they're practicing. And the number one uh, shortfall in people's practice, when I do find something that's off, there's a number of things it could be, but the number one thing is people have a very poor breath capacity, typically. A person who has been practicing Kriya Yoga for many years, typically if they've been practicing very well, will have a very developed breath capacity. The same thing with anybody who's practicing yoga practices of one discipline or another, at least on the physical side, will also have developed a very strong breath capacity. And I notice particularly when I try to encourage people to increase their breath capacity, the first thing is, and we teach this when you come into perhaps one of the very first classes, we teach people how to breathe diaphragmatically. Of course, that's here when you breathe, expanding the, the diaphragm, letting, or, or in simple terms, letting the belly come out as you inhale, and it naturally pulls air into uh, the lungs. But sometimes, the second thing though is, is this is where it is often overlooked when people are instructing. And I say that to you if, if you're a beginning instructor who's uh, just begun to teach others. When you're teaching people to breathe, yes, we do get, need people to breathe diaphragmatically because uh, many times they don't. But we also need to instruct students to be able to take a full breath and that means to fill the top one-third of the lungs as well. And I notice that many people, they'll breathe diaphragmatically, but they don't bring oxygen and air into the top part of their lungs. And so when we're breathing, we're inhaling, and if we can, you just you may even try it right now, inhale, and first your belly goes out as the diaphragm expands, then the, the sides of the lungs go out, but that top third of the lungs, up, way up here, that too needs to be filled. And what, to do that, unless you're practiced, to do that takes an act of will. And this is why many people don't, when they breathe, they don't breathe fully because they don't fill the top part of their lungs with air. And as you go through life, and particularly by the time that you've reached elder years, if you have not been breathing correctly, if you've been not completely filling the lungs, at that time you definitely have to put effort, a little effort, in other words, willpower, into your breathing in order to fill so that last part. And you can... If you inhale, now let's try it. Inhaling, you can fill the diaphragm, fill the chest, and then that last part, you inhale, and you can feel that little, maybe even a little burning sensation as you fill it all the way to the top. That takes effort. It takes a little uh, push. And then as you exhale, you let it out. Well, as you do this regularly, you finally, it becomes a habit and you don't, it doesn't take so much effort in the will. But if you do not fill that, and if you do not breathe properly, you're going to have a short breath capacity. And I'm no doctor, but I feel if your, if your lungs are weak and underdeveloped, you're likely to be more susceptible to pneumonia. So even if that isn't true, the fact that if you do not fill the breath completely, lungs completely, you're not accomplishing what breathing exercises in yoga is trying to accomplish. And particularly if you're a Kriyabhan, you're not filling the lungs with air and accomplishing what is one of the primary uh, goals behind the scenes when we practice Kriya. Because when we inhale and we breathe and bring in breath, what are we doing? The air is coming in and we are transmuting oxygen into life force. And you can feel this if you do your Kriya and you inhale fully, filling the top there and then 
concentrating at the point between the eyebrows with the full breath and just feel that vibrancy and then exhale. You can feel the life force increasing within your body. And as that life force increasing with the body, and this is why historically yogis have always said and incorporated into yoga practice deep breathing. But it has to be full breath. We say full yogic breath, but even it's filling the lungs completely with that air. And so I encourage you to practice this. And you do have to practice. Now, I do this. I'm giving this discourse this tonight from the Pune Center, uh, Center, and it's approximately one kilometer from where I stay. And I come here in the morning, many mornings during the week, and I walk early in the morning, which I very much hope you're doing as well, walking, exercising of some sort, but walking is an excellent uh, means of that. I walk here and I inhale four, ste four steps, one, two, three, four. I hold four steps, one, two, three, four. I exhale four steps, one, two, three, four. Inhale four, hold four, exhale four. If I run out of breath, I slow down. And if I got really good breath, actually when I start, I'm usually at five rather than four. But by the time I get here, I'm down to four. But if for some reason I'm even more tired, I go down to three. But in this way, and I'm trying to fill my, uh, my lungs with air, and by the time I come here in the morning, do my energization exercises, I'm energized. I've got, my body has become oxygenated, and if we put consciousness into that, so even if you're not a Kriya Bun, you inhale, you bring that life, that air in, feel as if you're bringing life force up to the point between the eyebrows, and then hold it there with that full, full lung capacity, Count to three, count to six, whatever you can, and then let it go and feel that life force, that oxygen being transmuted into life force. And if you do this again and again, so I'd say, if you're not used to this, practice this 12 times. But for those of you who are Kriya bonds, you should be practicing your Kriya now more frequently. Here we are locked in. There's a lockdown here in Pune, probably where you're staying as well. We have time on our hands. So today I did 108 Kriyas in the morning. And before coming here in the afternoon, I did 108 Kriyas in the afternoon. You can do that too. Now, if you're brand new, obviously you take, you build yourself up a little bit. But if you've been practicing Kriya for years now, now is your chance. You've got time. I hope we have the opportunity to be able to practice Kriya fully and faithfully as it is taught to us. So apply this, this energy that we energize the body with the oxygen, develop the lung capacity, and this way, if that virus should come knocking on our door, we're going to be healthy. We're going to have that breath capacity. So it's for physical reasons that I'm bringing this up. But there are spiritual reasons as well. But particularly physical, increase that breath capacity. Your whole life will be changed, even if that virus does not come for a visit. Now, the second point I want to address is as we grow older, and I, I meant for us, I was hoping when I, on Saturday I made a comment that I was hoping elders would tune in. Because when we grow older, our life force begins to decrease to some degree, unless we're consciously trying to replenish that and do something about it. And one of the reasons for that is that our willpower becomes more challenged. And it, those of you who are over 60, or maybe even before that, uh, you know what I'm talking about. It's harder to get up, you know, oh, I'm just going to, you know, the, you, to do things. You have to put out will to get something done much more than when you were 25. You know what I'm meaning. And the willpower starts to go down. So the simple things take that extra will. Well, I told a story yesterday at Satsang about a, a lady that had, she died of a, disease at Ananda Village many years ago, but she was diagnosed with it and given only a year to live. 
And she went to Swami Kriyananda and asked what should she do. And he said, do not give in to the consciousness of the disease. And she, had, you know, she did that and many different things. But she lived for 10 years and defied the doctor's uh, uh, predictions for her. But she did not give in to the consciousness of the disease. Now, I don't mean to say old age is a disease, but if you're an elder, don't give in to the consciousness that you're an old person and you're decrepit and you can't do anything and, oh, the body's not, is failing me. Paramahansa Yogananda said we should not even think, tell people how old we are, because as soon as we started doing that, we start identifying, oh, I'm old. This body is old is how we should say it, if you want to say that. But I'm not old. I'm eternal. I'm ageless. And But the worst part of that, not that we will start identifying with that, start self-limiting ourselves with that thought, but other people will start limiting you. While back a young fellow I know, I was doing chores around the house, and I was working up a sweat a little bit, which Master said is good. We should get us work a sweat up at least once a day. And he came, he came, he says, oh, don't exert yourself. And I thought, don't exert myself. That's a curse. He's hastening me down that paved road to the funeral pyre. Don't let people do that to you. Now, people mean this in a good way. And this is one of the nice things. You know, I'm American, raised in America, but I've lived enough in India now to come to appreciate something about India. The respect for elders. I like that. Especially now I'm an elder, you see, so I, I can find the benefit of it. But there's a two, it's a two-edged sword. There's that respect for elders, but pretty soon young people begin treating you as an old person. Oh, let me pick that bag up for you. Oh, let's not go up those stairs. Here, let's get the elevator. Oh, don't do that. I'm going to do it for you. On and on it goes until finally, at first you resist a little bit, but then pretty soon you start, you start buying into that consciousness that I'm old. You may not be able to carry that 25 kilo luggage anymore, but you can carry 15 or 10 or five. And so assert, don't allow your will to be weakened and by giving in. And it's important for those of you who are younger or watching this, you're not doing the elders a favor by treating them as children. My brother recently died. I had to go back to the USA a few months ago, taking care of his affairs, and he, he passed away. And for the last three years of his life, he lived in a, an assisted living facility uh, uh, three years he was, and it was so sad for me to go visit him. And they had wonderful caregivers there, and I was very admiring of the care that they would give him. But one thing very much disturbed me. They Not only my brother, but all of the other elders that were there in that care, care facility, they talked to him as if they were children. Oh, Ginny, how are you this morning? Oh, come, here's your, here's your breakfast. Oh, and they were like, they were like, um, uh, it was insulting. And now, of course, my brother wouldn't take it because he was not that type and he scared them away. But we, as elders, don't let people treat you that way. It's nice to receive honor and respect but don't let it, don't overdo it. And particularly, don't let it make you identified that I'm weak. Don't let it make you become passive because it's the natural progression of age that is going to slowly degrade our willpower. And we must be aware of that. Now, I can watch it happening in me as well, and we have to fight it. 
to the degree that we're able, not cooperate with that degrading influence of passivity that begins to come over us. And I think it's for those of you who have elders and family, pay attention to that. And I think, I think the ability to keep our will strong is essential for our ability to maintain our magnetism. And this is why you find a person when they're 30, 40, 50 years old, they're magnetic and full of energy. And then when they're 70 or 80, where's it? It's gone. It's seeped out. But we can resist that. Now, there's a certain element that are beyond our control, I know, and I'm overstating what, to, what I'm saying here, but I'm saying I'm doing that in order to make it a point. We must, as elders, keep our magnetism strong. And then we'll find that when troubles come, disease come, we find that we can fight it off and we can, we can maintain that aura around ourselves. So be realistic with your capacities. And yes, hand some of that luggage to somebody to carry for you, but don't in your mind give in to it. Don't identify with it. I know, I have to admit, and I suspect you can understand this. In some ways, when I think of myself, I think of myself, I'm still mentally, I'm still in some degree 30 years old. Maybe I'm 32, 35, somewhere like that. But then I look and I say, well, time's passed. I don't have that capability. Now, I have to, I have to recognize that and accede to that in certain ways. But mentally, we are children of God. We're ageless. And that's the same way when, when, uh, when Swami uh, was asked by Paramahansa Yogananda, he says, how are you today, Walter? And he said, well, he says, that's good, because he didn't allow Yogananda, or Yogananda did not allow Swamiji Kriyananda to identify, oh, I'm this mood, I'm this, I'm not feeling well. And to the degree that we can maintain that reality of who and what we really are, then we find that and combine it with that first point I meant today, that life force is strong within us. And then project that life force out through your eyes, through your voice, through your bearing, and you'll find that the magnetic aura around you will protect you. And you'll find that also from disease, but it'll also, people will begin to recognize that aura and respond to it. And you'll find that eventually, of course, you'll find God's presence. That strength that you have inside yourself, you'll be, feel that it's God's power flowing through you. It's God's vitality flowing through you. It's God's health flowing through you. You begin to feel that movement of life force within you and around you. And in this way, no virus is going to be able to touch you. So God bless. And that uh, there's the two points I wanted to make today. Now, this week, our class series is going to continue with Diana, and she's going to be in the mornings, uh, Wednesday morning uh, at... And Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday. and Friday morning eight at 8 o'clock. So if you go to Ananda India online, you'll be able to see there uh, the schedule and whatever you need to do in order to be able to tune into Dhyana Jean. She's going to be talking about different aspects along the same lines that what I've been talking about, particularly addressing certain attitudes. I will then return next Saturday in the evening and next Monday in the evening. And also, I remind you again, if you have questions, you can send them in on the chat function, or you can send them to online at anandaindia.org. Many blessings to you, and I look forward to speaking with you again next uh, Saturday evening.